Well, I guess Merry Christmas Eve, everybody. It's good to have you all with us this morning. Don't forget, we, we are coming back tonight for our candlelight service. We're all kind of set up for it, but we didn't actually light the candles yet, so we'll be doing that tonight. We're going to have a great time tonight. I hope that you'll come back. We've got our kids' choir that's going to be here with us this evening. It's going to be just a, a great evening together, so we hope that you'll come back tonight. Uh, there's still time to, to grab a friend of yours and bring him with you tonight. We, uh, we're going to have a great time at just that kind of that traditional Christmas Eve service that we, that we have. We tend to love this time of year, don't we? I mean, Christmas. I mean, what better time of the year is there than Christmas? I know that as I think through Christmas, there's one word that always comes to mind at this time of year. It's the word joy. Joy is like the best word I can think of to describe Christmas. I was, uh, every year at Christmas, we have this one Christmas decoration, I guess. I don't even remember when we got it. We got it since we moved here. Somebody gave it to us as a gift. And it's this little Christmas tree, and I think there's some other little characters on it, stuff like that. But it's this little Christmas tree. It's got 25 days on it, and every day you push a button. And it tells you how many days until Christmas. It's got a whole little story that it tells every single day and everything else. And that is my kids' favorite Christmas decoration of all time. And the minute we get that out, it's like every morning, December 1st, we make sure it's out because usually, usually we do our decorating right after, right after Thanksgiving. I, I have a rule in my house that there is no Christmas music, no Christmas decorations, nothing until after Thanksgiving. We, we kind of, hey, all right, good. Some of you are with me on that. Yeah, I, I've got one thumbs down over here from a kid, of course. It doesn't surprise me it's from a kid. We, uh, we don't, because we rush through Thanksgiving so often, don't we? And we don't ever give thanks for the things we're thankful for because, man, our minds are just focused right on Christmas. Which just brings the fact that it is a great time of year, isn't it? But we get this decoration out in December 1, they hit it. And, and, and every morning, I mean, this is basically what I wake up to every morning at 6 o'clock in the morning when the kids are getting ready for school and I'm packing their lunches and everything. I was, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy! 20 more days until Christmas. Daddy, eight more days until Christmas. And then, of course, today, only one more day. But my kids can't wait to get home because we're actually packing up and and going to uh, Missy's parents' house. So we're going to let them open their gifts from my mom and dad this afternoon. So they're like, because just that we don't want to take them with us, you know. I mean, we have to do that. And I know what they got. I know what the gifts are. And I do not want those gifts around me for a whole week. Uh, (laughs) I wouldn't say what they are, but it might travel down to them and then they'll figure it out or whatever. But they're so excited. And and when I think of this Christmas season, I think that's one of the reasons why we say this time of the season is filled with such joy. Kids are so excited about their Christmas gifts. We let them get their stockings this morning and they came down and they ripped them open and inside they each had a little jewelry box. And so they've got their jewelry on today because, you know, it's just, it's girl stuff, man. I don't get any of it, but it's girl stuff. And they've got their, Daddy, can you help me put my earrings in? No, because I will poke a brand new hole for you because I do not know how to do that kind of stuff. I have not figured it out yet. The other day, Melana goes, Daddy, I can't get my earring out. And unbeknownst to any of us, she had had these earrings in for like three months. And she had never taken them out. And you know what happens when you wear earrings for like three months? Those little backs get a lot of gunk on them. And it was stuck. Yeah, this is disgusting. I know. I know Missy's going to kill me for telling you all this story. I think, whoa, what? bad parents you guys are and i'm sitting there, i went and i'm pulling i said no daddy no and i'm pulling yanking on the ear her earlobes are now longer and uh, <laughs> her holes are just a hair bigger now too but finally i said i can't do it she takes it over to missy and miss gets says how long have you worn these earrings and that's when we find out but the kids they just go nuts and that's why at this time of year i think what joy we have isn't it But there's really another reason why I think we associate the word joy with this time of year, isn't there? There's this little baby that came over 2,000 years ago. This little baby that was born in a manger. 
And I think to myself, that's the greatest reason for our joy, isn't it? It's like the famous carol says, joy to the world, the Lord has come. But I wonder, how many of you are joyful this morning? I know for me, it's pretty easy when I come to church to be joyful. Uh, I, I love being here, obviously. I mean, this is what I do for a living. I love being here. I love singing the songs together and everything else. And sometimes I sit up here and I don't sing at all because I, I'm a terrible singer and I can hear how terrible I am. And sometimes I love to just listen to everybody else behind me sing. It brings such joy. And to me, it, it seems like it's so easy to be joyful when I come to church. But it's not always easy to feel joyful, is it? It's not always an easy thing. William Willimon, he was the dean at the chapel at uh, Duke University, he says that joy can be a challenge for the church. And I think he's right. Joy can be a challenge for the church. You know, we come to church and so often we, us pastors, we get up here and we, we tell you, don't do this, do this, don't do this, do this. And you can walk away oftentimes from a church service feeling kind of depressed some days, right? And part of our problem is that we've got the wrong idea about joy. We have the wrong idea about joy. We try to connect joy with circumstances, don't we? We try to connect joy with happiness. And part of our problem is that we jump from one party to the next, frantically trying to find that joy. And for some of us, we're sitting here this morning and we're struggling. We're struggling to find that joy. You see, you can't have joy from just going to one party the next, frantically running around, going to the shopping mall, although at this time of year I had to go to Walmart yesterday. Let me tell you what, that brought me no joy at all. I can't stand, I remember growing up and in, in, I grew up in, well, partly in Michigan, but part of my life, my growing up years, I always say, was in South Jersey. Going to the mall around Christmas time, not a lot of fun, okay? You go and there's just, everybody is, you, you can barely make it through the stores or anything. It just doesn't, that's an excellent way to lose your joy at this time of year. But where does Christmas joy really come from? Well, if you have your Bibles, open them up to Luke in chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, that's okay. It'll be on the screens. It's also in your notes and everything else. But follow along with me. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Now here's a quote from Dean Willimon that I think really kind of sums up Luke chapter 2. And I put this in your notes. Here's what he said. This is kind of a perspective of his. He says, Christmas is a delightful disruption to the way things normally go. And I like that phrase, delightful disruption, because I think it really sums up what Luke chapter 2 is really all about. One moment, these, th these shepherds are out in the fields and they're tending their sheep, and all of a sudden, bam, this host of angels shows up and scares them out of their minds. Can you imagine? I, I always tell you every week that I always try to put myself in, in, in kind of the shoes of the people that I'm, that I'm talking about that week. And I tried to put myself in, in the shoes of the shepherds. Can you imagine what that mu night must have been like? All of a sudden, you're out there in this field, and really, I mean, what really happens out in the field other than maybe a, a, a wolf or something coming? It's about the excitement that they get, which would be a lot of excitement if you think about it. And all of a sudden, this light just shines, and the sky just fills with these angels and they tell you this great thing. Now, I don't know how delightful that is, but it was a disruption, wasn't it? It was a disruption to the normal way that things go. The angel comes and says, good news of great joy that'll be for all the people. 
Well, what is the good news of great joy? Well, look at verse 11 there. And I'm going to tell it to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it to you out of the old King James Version because I think this is the way most of us memorize this passage of Scripture. It says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now, you know that it's out of the King James Version because Savior, when you pop that into Word document, it's underlined in red because they say it's not spelled correctly. This is the way we memorize this verse, isn't it? For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. If you're looking for Christmas joy, I suggest that this verse here is full of everything we need for all the joy at Christmas time. And I want to work through, we're going to work through just this one verse this morning. Number one in your notes the prophecy of his coming. The prophecy of his coming. You'll see I put the passage of scripture right underneath of it there. The prophecy of his coming. And notice the simple phrase, born this day in the city of David. Now the city of David is not the city of Jerusalem. You've got to understand that. Some people make that mistake and they think that, that the city of David is Jerusalem and it's not. It's actually this tiny little village that's about six miles south of Jerusalem known as Bethlehem. Today, Bethlehem is an Arab town. It's under Palestinian control. But back in this day and age, back when Jesus was born, it would have been this tiny, quiet, little Jewish community. Modern-day Bethlehem is kind of bustling, busy town. It's filled with thousands of people. And really, to get through the narrow streets, you're just almost shoulder-to-shoulder with people. The major industry in, today in Bethlehem would be tourism. And really, most people come for one reason and one reason only. And that is to see the church of the Holy Nativity. It's the very center of the city. This is one of the oldest churches that, that's ever been built in the Holy Land. It was built about 1,700 years ago. And then it was built upon, it's been added to, it's been renovated all throughout the centuries. But today when you visit Bethlehem, you'll have a hard time envisioning what it was like when Jesus was born. In 1867, a Boston pastor named Philip Brooks went and visited the Holy Land around Christmas time. Upon his return, he wrote a Christmas carol that was ultimately set to uh, music by his choir director that they were going to use for their next Christmas concert. We still sing the song today. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. He wrote that way because 130 years ago, Bethlehem was still a tiny little village, a quiet and peaceful place. Bethlehem is called the city of David because David was born there. David, just like the shepherds the night that Jesus came, David would have been out in the fields. I mean, kind of think of the the, the foreshadowing of all that's actually taking place here. David would have been right where those shepherds were, possibly. Possibly. When these angels come, he would have been tending the sheep just like them. And there's one fact about this that you need to know. 700 years earlier, the Lord had spoken to the prophet Micah and declared that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Here's the exact scripture from Micah 5-2. It's in your notes. It says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephratah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. And I want you to notice phrase, though you are small among the clans of Judah. Th- this prophecy came from the Lord in 700 BC. 700 years before Christ was ever even born, this, this prophecy comes. When Bethlehem was a tiny, inconsequential village, No one would have ever named Bethlehem as one of the top 10 vacation destinations to be at in Israel. If you went there, you you would have found just a few small, tiny little homes, and really, that was about it. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, it it was kind of off the beaten track, so to speak, if, if you know what I'm saying. However, all the Jews knew that the Messiah would be born here. Well, how do I know that? Well, Matthew 2 tells us that when the Magi, and we talked about this last week, when the Magi came in and then they, they saw Herod in Jerusalem, they, they asked, where is he who was born king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east and we have come to worship him. That's a good question, isn't it? That's a good question. Where is the Messiah going to be born? 
Well, Herod, he, he had kind of his theology council. And he gathered them all together. And he, because Herod wants to know the answer to this question because as we talked about last week, Herod was, was, was very concerned about his power. It didn't matter who it was. We talked last week of how he killed his brother-in-law, he killed his mother-in-law, he even killed his own wife because he thought that they were going to be, try to take over his power. In the end, he ultimately killed even his own children because he had heard that there was a plot to overthrow him. This guy was an evil guy, but he wants to know, where is this, the, the, this king who's going to be born king of the Jews? So he gathers this theology council and he asks the same question. And they reply to Herod by quoting Micah 5, 2. If you want to know where that episode is at, it's in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. And that's what I mean by the fact that all the Jews knew. God had told them 700 years before Jesus was even born where Christ would be. There was no secret about it. As a side note, I've always been fascinated by the fact that even though the Magi have suddenly shown up in Jerusalem, and even though the theologians knew where the baby was to be born, and even though Bethlehem was only six miles south of Jerusalem, as far as we know, not a single one of them ever took the time to go and find out for themselves if Jesus had really been born. We talked about this last week, that they were totally indifferent to the birth of Christ to the birth of the Messiah. They missed the most important event in world history because they couldn't be bothered. How different these shepherds are, aren't they? Now, how different these shepherds are. As good Jews, they too, they would have known the prophecy of Micah. And when the shepherds hear the glad tidings that Christ has come, they respond by saying, let's go straight to Bethlehem. The theologians, they knew the truth. And they couldn't be bothered. The shepherds who were the lowest of the low in society at that time, they wanted to find out. They wanted to see for themselves. They believed immediately and they acted upon it. So when we read City of David, we should remember that Jesus was born in fulfillment of a prophecy that was made 700 years before his birth. It should also remind us that knowledge alone is never enough to save us. You know, when I look at this and I think about this scripture, that's really the biggest thing I take from it. Knowledge alone is not enough to save us. You know, there's a lot of us, and even some of us sitting here this morning, and we sit back and we go, yeah, I know about Christ. I know about God. I know about the Messiah. Well, good for you. The Bible says even the demons know and believe in him. It's not enough to know. It's not enough to just know. It has to become very intimate and personal for you. It's not enough to just know all this knowledge. I could sit back, you know, the other day, well, not the other day, this is some years ago. I was talking with a guy who, who told me, I'm an atheist. I, I, I want nothing to do with God. Now, we sat down and we began to discuss the Bible. And let me tell you something, folks. This guy knew the Bible better than most of you. Even had some questions that I couldn't answer. I had to go and study for myself and come back and, and continue on the conversation with him. This guy knew the Bible. It's not enough to know. It has to become personal. It has to. It's not what you know, folks. It's what you do with what you know. That's what makes the difference. Number two. Number two, the reality of his coming. The reality of his coming. Let's look again at the text. It's right there in your notes. It's right on the screens right now. It says, The angel says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David. They speak to the fact They speak to the fact that what happened in Bethlehem was nothing less than the birth of a baby named Jesus Christ. Now, there's two aspects of this truth that you need to understand. The first is that there are no miracles, and you got to hear this, okay, because we often make this mistake. There are no miracles associated with the physical birth of Jesus Christ. Did you hear me? There's no miracles associated with the physical birth of Jesus Christ. 
Even though we often speak of the virgin birth of Christ, it's important to remember that the angel performed that miracle nine months before Jesus was ever born. When he overshadowed Mary with the results that although she was a virgin, she would become pregnant. That was an enormous miracle which has never been repeated in the history of the world. However, from that point on, Mary's pregnancy really ultimately followed the normal course of all human pregnancies as far as we know leading to that momentous night in Bethlehem when she would give birth to the Lord Jesus Christ in a stable. Although Luke kind of gives us really no details, we're going to safely assume that it was just a normal birth. Or at least as normal as a birth in strange places. And we read stories all the time of babies that are born. When Milena was being born, I, I, I'm a nervous person. And this is a crazy story, and I don't even know why I'm telling you this, but probably because it's funny and I like to be funny. Uh, we, we, she, I, we were getting ready to go to bed, and I, I could tell that she was a little off that day. And obvious, I mean, she's, she's, the baby's getting ready to come. And I said to her, we're getting ready to go to bed, and I said, Missy, please, don't wake me up in the middle of the night to have this baby. Along about 2 o'clock in the morning, she wakes me up. All right. She says, Andrew, I'm going to have a baby. I said, I told you not to wake me up in the middle of the night to have this baby. Well, as I said, and, and of course, I was joking. I know Becky's over here like, what? Right. I was joking around. But anyways, so we get ready. And like I said, I'm a nervous person. We had to stop five times on the way to the hospital so I could go to the bathroom. <laughs> Not even a lie, not even a joke. Five times, I get out and have to go to the bathroom because once I got to go, I can't hold it. And so I come back in and Missy goes, you really got to get me to the hospital. Well, my mom is with us too because at that time, my mom and dad lived with us in the house. My mom's going, Andrew, what is wrong with you? We got to get her to the hospital. I thought for certain we were going to have a car birth because there was just, I mean, what, are you, what do you do? And I was terrified. So finally, we finally got to the hospital and she was fine. No big deal. <laughs> But such instances, they're normal births, aren't they? And they happen in extraordinary ways. Well, the birth of Jesus really falls into that category. A true event that took place in a normal way in a very abnormal situation. Second of all, it's important to remind ourselves that the phrase this day in Scripture means that it really happened. Francis Schaeffer is one of, my, one of my favorite authors. If you've never read anything by Francis Schaeffer, he was a great Christian philosopher. If you, if you haven't read his stuff, pick up a book by Francis Schaeffer. You'll love it. Francis Schaeffer used to talk about lower story truth and upper story truth. Lower story truth is made up of the facts of history, things that really happened at a certain time and place to a particular people. By contrast, upper story truth refers to fables and stories like the fables of Aesop. Things that everyone knows they aren't true, but but they're ultimately meant to bring about religious truth. Many people today, they read Luke 2 and they call it upper story truth. It's just simply too fantastic to believe, or so they say. And now, let's just be honest with each other this morning. When we come to Christmas time and we talk about this girl who gets pregnant but never had any sexual intercourse, How is that possible? Can we all just be honest with each other that it seems a little far-fetched at times? That's a true statement, right? It seems that way. I'm just going to be human with you right now. And just understand that this, we read some of these stories sometimes in Scripture and we go, yeah. But see, that's when faith comes into play. And that's when understanding that Scripture comes from God. And that sometimes it doesn't match up with our reality. It doesn't. God doesn't always match up. That's what makes Him God, folks. He doesn't have to match up with our reality in order for us to believe it. But I know. I know. I know some of you struggle with this belief. I know that some of you struggle with this story. Some of you struggle with this whole crazy idea. Well, there was a group of people who struggled with this. Some of you may remember this whole idea of the Jesus Seminar. The Jesus Seminar, there was this group of liberal scholars who they used colored pebbles to vote on whether or not the gospel stories about Jesus are true or not. 
Well, several years ago, they voted down the virgin birth of Christ. The, the, the vote was 24 to 1 against the virgin birth of Christ. Voting with multicolored pebbles, these pundits decided that Mary must have had sexual intercourse either with Joseph or some unknown interloper before she became pregnant with Jesus. They also decreed the visit of the wise men of fabrication, the slaughter of the innocents, which is proven through history, just so you know, folks. The slaughter of the innocents as fiction, and the flight of the Holy Family into Egypt, a fanciful allegory drawn from the Moses story in Exodus. Now, I mention that because the Christian church has always professed belief in the virgin birth. That, that goes back thousands of years to when the virgin birth happened. We've professed this. The ancient creed puts it this way, conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. This one truth has always been believed by all Christians everywhere. So to use Francis Schaeffer's term, the birth of Jesus is lower story truth. It really and truly happened. So when we read, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, let's remind ourselves that it points to something true to something that really happened. It's not a legend. It's not a myth. It's not some fairy tale that we just pull out of thin air. This is truth. It has stood the test of time, folks. Most of the time, you know, back when, back, back when the, the message of Christ was being, it was being spread throughout Jerusalem and all the area, the, 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 the people who were against it, they ultimately thought, it's just going to die away. Just let it go. It's, it's just going to be like every other religion and it's just going to die away. It's just going to go away and nobody's going to ever have to worry about it. But that's not what happened to Christianity, is it? It didn't just die away. It didn't just go away. It grew and it grew and it grew and it grew and it's still growing today in certain parts of the world. Not in America, but in certain parts of the world. You see, everything about the story is true including the central truth that there really was a baby born in Bethlehem who really is the Son of God. Number three, number three. I need to speed up here. Number three, the result of his coming. The results of his coming. It should be result, there shouldn't be an S there. The result of his coming. And now we come really to the climax of this verse. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. And here's an interesting fact that comes from the Greek text of Luke chapter 2. When Luke wrote his account, he he didn't use any articles to describe Jesus. So when we read, a Savior who is Christ the Lord, here's how Luke actually wrote it. He would have said, Savior, Christ, Lord. There would have been nothing in there to describe it. Each word of this is vitally important to the text. Savior, and this is in your notes, Savior is actually an Old Testament word that means one who believes, one who delivers his people. One who delivers his people. Lord is a term for deity, in other words, being God. And Christ is a Greek version of the Hebrew word Messiah, which means the anointed one. Folks, listen. In our world today, and you have to agree with me on this, whether you're a follower of Christ or not this morning, you got to agree with this. We are in desperate need of a Savior. We are. Whether you follow Christ or not, we have to admit that. Look at the world around us, folks. It is falling apart at its seams. We need a Savior. When the angel announced the birth of Jesus to Joseph, he said this, it's in Matthew 121, I think I put it in your notes. He said, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. I read a story this week about about a father and his kids had, very young, had accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they prayed for their dad every single day for 40 years. They prayed for their dad. Well, their dad ultimately got really sick. And the pastor from their church came to see him, led him to Christ. The kids came to see him the next day. And as the kids came in, they walked in and he grabs his son. This is a true story. He grabs his son and he says, son, have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And he said, dad, yeah, I've been telling you about Jesus. I've been telling you about him for 40 years, Dad. He said, where's, where's your wife? Where's your wife? She's got to know. She's got to know about Christ. He says, Dad, she knows. All of us know. And he says, you mean this is what you've always been talking about with me? His heart was so hardened against what his kids were telling him that he just couldn't hear it. He couldn't hear it. You see, folks, 
That's why Christ came. To be a savior for everyone who will turn to him. But not only that, he came to be the Lord or ruler of the universe. And today he is the Lord of heaven. One day he will return. He's going to set up his kingdom on the earth. And between now and then, we Christians are called to make him Lord of our lives on a daily basis. And that means surrendering your will to him and letting him lead you, letting him guide you. Folks, listen, he is our Savior. He is the Lord and he is the Christ and he is the Messiah, the one sent from God. Now, I called this the result of his coming, and in a sense, that's actually not a true statement. It's not. It's not completely accurate. He is Savior, Lord, and Christ even without his coming. But if he didn't come, we would have never known it. The truth of Jesus Christ would have been forever hidden from us. And folks, this, this is the heart of, of Christmas. God loved us enough to send his only begotten son. Think of it this way, folks. He didn't send a committee. He didn't write a book. Eventually he did, but at this point he didn't write a book. He didn't send a substitute. No. When God got ready to come to this world, God sent himself, really. His one and only son. And in sending Jesus, he was really sending himself, wasn't he? This is the truth of Christmas. Emmanuel, God with us. Number four, the purpose of his coming. The purpose of his coming. Our text contains one final truth for our consideration. In our text, the truth comes from from really the first. It says, for unto you is born this day in the city of David. And I want you to pause for a moment and I want you to consider who was speaking and who was being addressed. When the shepherds heard these words from the angels, they must have just absolutely been beside themselves, right? I mean, I would be. Beside themselves. We tend to overlook the fact that shepherds were near the bottom of the social rung. Matter of fact, when, 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 when these kids were in school and they were writing out what they wanted to be in life, shepherd was probably not something they were going to put on their like career preference forms. There were a lot easier ways to make a living in Israel. Doug Goines, he, he wrote, just from, this is from one of his sermons. He paints a vivid picture of how shepherds were viewed in that day. And here's what he said in one of his sermons. He says, The Judean shepherds were the lowest of the low, socially common men, a despised class with a bad reputation. Shepherds were known as thieves because they were nomadic. And as they moved their sheep around the country, sometimes they got confused about what was mine and what was thine. They were all tarred with the same brush, untrustworthy, dishonest. They were not allowed to give testimony in a Jewish court of law. Their work made it impossible for them to observe the Jewish ceremonial laws and temple rituals, so they were considered religiously unclean and unacceptable. It's pretty amazing to think this heavenly invasion came to such social outcasts. Think about that. So when the angel says, to you is born, he's really saying, Christ came for the lowly shepherds. But what about those theologians in Jerusalem who knew and didn't care? Well, he came for them too. But they never knew about it. They never knew about it. When Christ came, his birth was first announced to the outcast of society. And I love that. Don't you like that? I mean, think about that for a second. The outcast of society is who God announced to first. I like that. To me, that shows what Christ is really all about, doesn't it? Shows what he's all about. He came for the forgotten people of this world. The shepherds were forgotten people. Mary and Joseph were forgotten people. And yet Jesus chose Mary, this forgotten little teenage girl, to be the instrument to bring the Savior of the world to this world. Isn't it usually the forgotten people who are the most excited and the ones who receive it with the greatest joy? Isn't it? Let me make a few simple applications as we close. The angel said, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. Unto you. He came for you. Unto you. And this, folks, this is where Christmas becomes intensely personal. It's not enough to say abstractly that you believe in Christ and you believe Christ came. Millions of people say that. 
Millions of people are still lost in their sins. And it's not enough to say that Christ came for someone else. You can never be saved until you say, He came for me. He came for me. He died for me. In just a few minutes here, we're going to celebrate communion together. Oh, what, a, what a great Sunday to celebrate communion. This baby that came in the manger to give his life, and we're going to remember his death this morning. Because really, that's what Christmas ultimately in the end becomes all about, isn't it? Isn't it interesting that through Scripture, we are never told to celebrate the birth of Christ, but we're told to celebrate the death. We're never told to celebrate the birth, but we do. We do because without the birth, there would be no death. It's not enough to say that he died for other people or just to believe that Christ came. He came for you. He died for you. He rose from the dead for you. He came for you. And the question this morning is, do you believe that? Tomorrow, Christmas is going to be here. Families are going to gather together. We're going to be gathering with Missy's side of the family. You're going to get gifts. Are you going to open those gifts tomorrow? Of course you are. You're not just going to let them sit there. What use is a gift if it's just never unopened? Over 2,000 years ago, God sent a gift wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Jesus is God's Christmas gift to you. But you will never, listen, you will never experience Christmas joy until you personally receive God's gift, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me close the words of the angel to the shepherds. It's not in your notes or anything. I just want you to listen. Here's what he said. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy which shall be for all people. And what is the source of that joy? For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus. And Father, as we come to this Christmas Eve service, Father, we need to be reminded that this baby came for a reason. And this baby came to bring about salvation. This baby came in a manger, brought about from forgotten people, at least socially forgotten people. And he came for a reason. As we're going to celebrate in just a few minutes here through communion, Father, he came to give his life as a ransom for many, for all. Father, your word says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And we thank you for the promise of Scripture. And maybe you're sitting here this morning and you've never, you've never taken that step of making Christmas intensely personal. That this baby came for you. He came for you. If you're sitting here this morning and you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And I know as we talk about this story, maybe this is one of the first times you've been in church or you just really struggle with all of this virgin birth stuff and everything else. I know it can be out there. I understand that. I want to recognize that. But at the same time, Jesus really did come really did come through a virgin and has stood the test of time. And he really did come to die in your place, to rise again so that we could have eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's why he came. That's why we celebrate Christmas. And maybe you're sitting here this morning and you've never made him Lord of your life. You've never made him CEO of your life. And you're saying today, Andrew, this Christmas Eve, I want to accept Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. I want that Christmas joy that I know, I know now only Jesus can bring to me. And if that's you, would you just pray quietly in your heart, just you and God. Say, Father, I need your Son. 
And right now I'm asking him to come into my life to save me from all of my sins. Thank you, God, for your son, Jesus. Thank you for the death of Jesus so that I could have eternal life.